In k means, we have this hyperparameter k and we need to decide the value for k in advance. How do we tune this hyperparameter? In supervised setting, we had this set procedure for hyperparameter tuning. We split the data, we carry out cross-validation, and we pick the value of the hyperparameter that gives us the best cross-validation score. When we had multiple hyperparameters, we use grid search or random search. Now, in unsupervised setting, things are not as easy because we do not have target values. So we cannot really measure the effectiveness of the algorithms in an objective way. And there is no definitive approach for hyperparameter tuning. That said, there are some strategies that might be useful to determine the value for k in the context of k-means clustering. We are going to look at two such methods. The first one is the elbow method. This method looks at the sum of intra-cluster distances. What are intra-cluster distances? For each point in our data set, we compute the square distance of that point with its cluster center. And then we sum these distances, we sum these square distances together, and we do that for each cluster. And we sum everything together, and that's our intra-cluster distance. This intra-cluster distance is also referred to as inertia. So let's try this out. In sklearn, you can access this intra-cluster distance using this attribute called inertia underscore. So this is some data I, I'm creating here. And in this cell, I'm uh, creating different models for k-means in the range of 1 to 100. Okay, and then these are our inertia values. So let's look at values for k and different inertia values corresponding to these k's. So what do we see here? When our k is 1, our inertia is this big number. And as our k increases, our inertia decreases. So now the question is, do we want inertia to be small or large? And this is not that straightforward. The problem is that we cannot just pick the value of k that minimizes inertia. For example, if you have number of clusters equal to number of examples, then each example will have its own personal cluster. And the intra-cluster distance in that case would be zero. But we do not really want that, right? We do not want each example to have its own cluster. We want to find patterns in this data. We want to find groups in this data. So instead of just looking at the value of inertia, we evaluate the trade-off of small k versus small intra-cluster distances. So we do not want a very large value for k, but we also do not want inertia to be very, very large. Now let's see how we can do that. Again, there is no definitive method here. Things are kind of vague in the context of unsupervised learning. Okay, so here I'm plotting inertia and k. Okay, on the x-axis we have k values, on the y-axis we have inertia. And the plot here, it looks like an elbow. And that's why this method is called an elbow method. And what do we see here is initially for different values for k. So for k equal to 1, our inertia is very, very high. For k equal to 2, the, it drops off drastically but still the inertia is very, very high. Then for k equal to 3, the inertia drops. Uh, the drop is not that dramatic, but uh, it is significant. And after 3, inertia doesn't drop much. So we say that, okay, for 3, 
the inertia so it is the smallest value for k and the inertia value is also not that big and so that's why we pick 3 in this case so in elbow method we plot k versus inertia and we pick this point of inflection on the curve as the best number of clusters. Now note that in this toy example, because our clusters are very, very clear here, this plot is very straightforward and easy to interpret. But this is not always the case in real world examples. Now you don't always have to write code to plot k versus inertia. There is this package called yellow brick, which can be used to create these plots conveniently. Okay, so what does it give us? So I'm importing this elbow visualizer here. I'm creating k-means model, and I'm passing our model and some values for k here. And this is what uh, our yellow brick package gives us. So on the x-axis, again, we have k. On the y-axis, we have distortion score, and that is actually inertia. And this green line, it shows the time that took to fit our data. And it also gives us this elbow at k equal to 3 and inertia score for k equal to 3. Another method that we can use to choose k is the silhouette method. Unlike the elbow method, the silhouette method is not dependent on the notion of cluster centers. The elbow method is kind of specific to the k-means algorithm because it is based on this notion of cluster centers. The silhouette method can be used for other clustering algorithms as well. This method calculates something called the silhouette score for each sample using mean intra-cluster distance and mean nearest cluster distance. Let's look at these distances. The first distance is mean intra-cluster distance. What does it mean? So suppose this is some clustering given by some clustering algorithm. We have three clusters here, black, blue, and red. And Consider this green sample point from our data set. How do we calculate mean intra-cluster distance for this sample? We calculate distance of this green point with all points from the same cluster. These distances are denoted with these black lines here. We take average of these distances, and that is our mean intra-cluster distance for this green point. Now, what is mean nearest cluster distance? To calculate mean nearest cluster distance, first we need to find out the nearest cluster. How do we do that? Now, for this green point, first we calculate its distances to all points from this red cluster, and we take average of that. And then we take distances of this green point to all points in this blue cluster, and we take average of that. We take the minimum of these two averages, and uh, average with minimum is our neighbor cluster, that is our nearest cluster. So in our case, this blue cluster will be the nearest cluster for this green point. And the average distance of uh, this green point to all points in this blue cluster will be the mean nearest cluster distance. Now note that we are not dependent upon this idea of cluster centers. We calculate distance of each sample to all points in other clusters or the same cluster. Now we calculate silhouette score for each sample. The silhouette score is just the difference between the average nearest cluster distance, which we calculated before, and the average intra-cluster distance, which again we calculated before. And then we normalize that, and that's our silhouette score 
for a sample. Now, since we are normalizing it, so the best value is one, the worst value is minus one, and the value near zero means we have many overlapping clusters. The overall silhouette score is the average silhouette scores for all samples. How do we use silhouette scores to select the number of clusters? That's the whole point, right? We are doing all these things so that we know how to pick the right number of clusters. I'm going to demonstrate this using the yellow brick package that we used before. And this is the silhouette plot given by this yellow brick package. What do we see here? On the x-axis, we have silhouette scores. On the y-axis, we have cluster labels. In this particular case, I'm running k-means with two clusters, so we only have two clusters here. We only have two labels. And these lines here, these colors here, they are silhouette scores for different samples in that particular cluster. So this blue color here, what we see here is these. there are these lines, blue lines, and these are silhouette scores for samples in cluster zero. This red line indicates average silhouette score. Higher silhouette score means we have well-separated clusters. And the size of silhouette shows how many samples there are in that particular cluster. So in this particular case, we see that cluster zero has more samples compared to cluster one. Now let's try a couple of more values. So this is our silhouette plot with k equal to three, that is number of clusters equal to three. And this is our silhouette plot with k equal to five. Now we see that this plot looks kind of nicer compared to the one we saw before. The clusters are kind of well balanced. We also don't see drastic drop off here. So let's see what to look for in these plots exactly. Now, unlike inertia, larger values are better for silhouette score because when we have larger silhouette score, it indicates that the points are further away from the neighboring clusters and the clusters are well separated. Now the thickness of each silhouette indicates the cluster size. And if all clusters have kind of similar thickness, then that means we have well-balanced clusters. And slower drop off here is also better. Some final comments on silhouette scores. Unlike inertia, larger values for silhouette scores are better because they indicate that the clusters are well separated. Unlike inertia, the overall silhouette score gets worse as you add more clusters because when you have many clusters, then that means that each sample is very close to the neighboring clusters. Now, silhouette scores are not that easy to interpret. There is no some peak value of this metric that indicates that this is the best number of clusters. We can visualize silhouette scores using silhouette plots, and it kind of gives us some intuition about what K we should pick. Unlike the elbow method, we can use the silhouette method to pick the number of clusters for methods other than k-means clustering.